Good evening. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, I appreciate you coming out um, to get information. Um, as uh, Mrs. Miller said, my name is Wendy Roletter Sook. I'm the Director of Financial Aid at Fort Hayes State University. However, tonight I am here on behalf of the Kansas Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators, or CASPA. Um, which is the organization of student financial aid administrators in the state um, and we host financial aid nights throughout the state um, as part of our professional service to the organization. So the information I'm providing tonight will be general in nature. It won't be specific to Fort Hayes State University. Um, I may give you some examples of how things may be done at our institution, uh, but you'll want to follow up with the institutions you or your child is interested in um, to, to get some clarification or more information on certain topics. I also want to introduce Robin Brungart. Um, she's a financial aid counselor in our office and she will be here um, to help address questions as well. Um, I'm happy to take some general questions at the end of the session. Um, if you have them, I would be happy to answer those. But if you have more specific questions that are specific to your student, Robin and I will be available probably just at the end of the, the aisles here um, to help you and answer any of those questions that you might have at that time. How many students do I have here tonight? Several, fantastic. I love to see students at this event. Um, I, I appreciate you being here. Parents, I appreciate you bringing them if you um, forced them to be here. I do think student involvement is critical in the entire process of, of looking at colleges and then going through that process. I think it's particularly important in the financial aid side of things um, because there's a lot of, of, I think, responsibility that students should, should take and be a part of as um, they progress and, and move through the financial aid process. It can be complicated, um, but it's something that they'll do every single year. So the more information they can get right now, the better. I do know that some students weren't able to be here even if they wanted to be, or even if the parents wanted them to be with other commitments. So for those who aren't, please take this information back to your students um, and make sure to, to involve them in the process um, from completing the FAFSA, through the end of it. Um, so please make sure that, that you engage them um, and help transition that to them um, then as they move on through their college career. Okay, so what we're talking about tonight is what you need to know about financial aid um, for 2018-19. Um, for those of you, how many of you have um, other students already in college? Okay, a few of you. Um, so you may remember there was a time where we didn't start talking about the FAFSA until January. Um, that has changed, first time being last year, that this process has moved up so that the FAFSA is now available October 1st, which means we barely get a chance to breathe after we start the semester for the fall and we're ready to jump in for the next year already. Um, but I think that's been a really good change for students um, and really have um, allowed them to get um, that information earlier to schools and, and get information back from schools earlier as well. So what we're going to talk about tonight um, uh, several different items um, and we'll go into too much more detail on these we're going to talk generally what co what financial aid is what the cost of attendance may include what the expected family contribution is what financial need is um, how you can figure out what different categories types and sources um, of financial aid might be out there for you and your student what the free application for federal student aid is and we'll also talk about some special circumstances that may apply um, to your situation so when I talk about financial aid, I define that term very broadly to mean anything, um, any type of funds that would be provided to students and families to help pay for post-secondary educational expenses. So this could be grants and scholarships, which we love because usually that's free money, um, but it could also mean loans, uh, could mean work study um, as well. Um, but very broad definition um, and educational expenses also um, is a broad definition. So when we say educational expenses, those are the different types of items that we use to create what we call a cost of attendance. Sometimes it can also be referred to as a budget. That would include tuition and fees, room and board, books and supplies, transportation, and personal expenses. Schools may also have a miscellaneous um, category which could include some other items as well. But then it's important to know what are direct costs and what are indirect costs. 
Direct costs would be those items that are directly billed to the student and they pay directly to the institution. Um, that could be tuition and fees and room and board. Those are probably the most common. Um, could be books and supplies at some institutions, um, but it may not be. Um, and then indirect costs would be those other items like personal expenses or transportation expenses. And I always encourage students and families to sit down and put together their estimate for a cost of attendance. Uh, many times the schools that your student or you are applying to will give you an estimated cost of attendance, um, but they usually have some their estimates for groups of students. So for instance, for things like transportation or personal expenses, those can vary widely from student to student. You know, if you have a student who is attending an institution in your hometown, they may have less in the way of transportation expenses than a student who is attending an institution that's out of state um, or six or seven hours from your home. They may have more in the way of transportation costs. So I think it's very helpful to sit down with your student and try to get a really good estimate of what you think it's going to cost um, for some of those um, indirect costs. The direct costs, I think, are usually a little bit easier to determine. Um, institutions will provide the information about what their tuition and fee rates are, um, as well as their room and board. At this point, um, you could probably take a look at what their, their uh, costs are for the 17-18 academic year, understanding that chances are they're going to increase. Um, hopefully not significantly, but they probably will increase for 18-19. Um, and if your student is, is planning to attend an institution um, by the, the, by, governed by the Kansas Board of Regents, those tuition fees are not set, as you may know, until June. So we do our best to give good estimates to students, realizing though that those tuition numbers will not be set, um, finalized until the summer. As I indicate there on the end, the cost of attendance can vary widely um, from college to college. So I always think it's helpful to come up with you know, your list of all these items and then do a comparison. If, if cost is one of those factors that's really important to you and, and your student or your student um, in determining one of the factors of, of where they may attend, um, come up with a sheet and do some side-by-side -side comparisons. Make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. And then what is the expected family contribution? The expected family contribution, or what you will hear frequently referred to as the EFC, is the amount that a family could reasonably be expected to contribute to a student's education. The EFC is determined um, by the federal government when a student submits the FAFSA by a federal formula. And it will be the same no matter where you go to school. So whether you go out of state, to a private, to a public, it doesn't matter, um, your EFC will remain the same. It will be made of two components. It will include the parent contribution as well as the student contribution. <coughs> okay, and then in determining need, you take the cost of attendance for an institution, you subtract the EFC, and that will determine financial need, um, which will be important in determining eligibility for some federal programs and perhaps some scholarships as well. So this graphic, I think, does a pretty good job of explaining how EFC and cost of attendance may impact your need. So your cost of attendance is variable. That's gonna vary from school to school. Your EFC is going to stay the same. Um, but when you subtract the EFC from your cost of attendance, you're going to get a different amount of need. So it's possible that you could have need at one institution, but not have need at another institution. And that's due to the variation in the cost of attendance. So what are some of the types of financial aid? Um, types I classify into two different categories, gift aid and self-help aid. Um, gift aid scholarships and grants, the best kind, you don't have to pay back generally, um, or self-help aid, which would be considered your loans or employment. And those financial aid items or types can come from different sources. One source can be the federal government, which is um, governed or determined by completing the FAFSA. Could be states. Um, states could require the FAFSA, but they may have an additional application, as does the state of Kansas. Um, colleges and universities, of course, provide aid, usually in the way of scholarships and grants. Um, maybe employment as well. Um, private sources 
civic organizations and churches or employers. Lots of community scholarship opportunities for students. Um, and I'll talk just briefly about that more um, towards the end of the presentation. So let's talk about federal programs. Um, federal financial aid is also sometimes referred to as Title IV financial aid. Um, Title IV governs all federal financial aid. So I'm gonna highlight the programs, the federal programs, and give you just kind of some basic information about all of them. Pell Grants are determined based on the EFC, the Expected Family Contribution. So it is, if your EFC hits a certain level, then you or your student is awarded a Pell Grant. Those can range based on the EFC as well as based on the enrollment level of the student. So for example, a full-time student will have a higher Pell Award than a half-time student. Um, for 2017-18, those range from $296 to $5,920, and that is for the academic year, um, which would run fall and spring semesters. The Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant is a grant that is designated for the neediest of students. Um, usually that means that students who have a zero EFC could be eligible for the FSEOG um, grant. That program is what we call a limited funded program. And this is where things like priority deadlines come into play. Um, many schools, if they have FSEOG funds, have a limited amount. And some, maybe all of them, um, will award based on um, first come, first serve. So the earlier you have your FAFSA in, the better chance you have of being awarded those funds if you are eligible. So that is one of the most important reasons why to meet priority deadlines for schools. And I'll talk more about that too at the end. Uh, the TEACH grant is a grant program designed for those who are planning to teach in high need fields in high need geographic areas. Um, it does require that students complete an agreement to serve as well as teach counseling before they are awarded um, because the thing with this grant program is that it is a grant so it is free money to the student however the student does need to need to meet the teaching obligation in order for that to remain a grant if they don't meet the teaching obligation that turns into an unsubsidized loan um, and interest will revert back and accrue from the date that it was dispersed to the student. So we always really encourage students, if they are not 100% sure that they're planning to teach in a high need field in a, in a high need geographic area, to wait on the TEACH grant until they're sure that they're going to do that. Um, because if they don't meet that obligation, like I said, that turns into an unsubsidized loan. And we wanna make sure students are aware of that before taking on those additional funds. The Kansas Comprehensive Grant um, is a grant that is governed um, by the state of Kansas. It is just grant funding is determined by the, uh, the Kansas legis legislature. It is available at four-year colleges and universities in the state of Kansas. You do have to be a Kansas resident and you do have to have need in order to be eligible for the Kansas Comprehensive Grant. It is also a limited funded program. So submitting the FAFSA early and by the priority deadline gives you the best chance of being awarded what we call a KCG. So now on to self-help aid. Um, federal work study. Um, the federal work study program gives students an opportunity to earn some of their money to help pay for their educational resources. Um, the uh, students have to go through a regular um, job search process, have to be hired into a job, but if they have a work study award, some of their wages are go going to be paid for <laughs> through the federal program. Um, this helps in a couple of different ways. One is, on the employer side of things, um, student, or employers or departments, let's say, on campus who have um, wor a work study student um, won't have to pay for all of their salary in their own departmental funds. The work study program pays for that. So departments love work study programs, right? Um, the, the advantage to the student is that in the subsequent year when they file the FAFSA, that information, or sorry, the income that they earn through the work study award does not count against them in the EFC calculation. So they get a benefit as well. Um, as, as I indicated before, there are a lot of departments who really like work study jobs because it helps them on their budget. So there may be some 
jobs out there that a student has to have work study in order to apply for. Um, but even if your student does not have work study, um, many colleges have, have a number of on-campus jobs that are paid for by departmental funds that don't require work study. Um, and I am a big proponent for on-campus jobs. Um, I think our, especially at our institution, I think we do a really good job of working with students, working with class schedules, um, understanding that school comes first um, with students um, that really is a benefit to the student and also can work with their schedules that they can you know work between classes or things like that the convenience I think is there as well for federal direct loans uh, the the two loans that are awarded to students or potentially awarded to students in their name are subsidized and unsubsidized direct loans um, the subsidized loan is the loan that uh, the Department of Education covers the interest while the student is enrolled at least half time. So interest does not accrue while the student's enrolled, um, which is a better loan. It is a need-based loan though, so you have to have need in order to qualify for a subsidized loan. The unsubsidized loan does not require need, so virtually any student would be eligible for at least an unsubsidized loan. Um, interest will accrue on that while the student is enrolled however it will defer until the student is no longer enrolled at least half time students can elect to make that interest payment if they choose to do that while they're in school but they're not required to do that um, of course it is important to note that that interest will capitalize um, and be added to the principal once they graduate um, and then go into repayment the freshman annual loan limit is $5,500 and that includes subsidized or unsubsidized loans so it's a $5,500 total limit for the freshman year um, that will change when they become sophomores and that will be defined by the school at what number of credit hours a school um, deems them a sophomore student that increases to $6,500 and then for junior and senior level, um, that increases to 7,500 for the year. Um, and that includes, that's basically a fall spring award. Um, it is important to note that if your student thinks about summer school um, and those opportunities, depending on how the school treats summer, um, the example I can give you is that at Fort Hayes, we treat it as what we call a trailer. So our, um, our year goes fall, spring, summer. So if a student takes out the full eligibility and they fall in the fall and spring, they may not have eligibility for the summer term. And while we're talking summer, just real quickly, at most institutions, the summer term is a separate application process, just an internal application to the school. So if your student is thinking about that, kind of put that on their radar in the spring. If they haven't heard from the financial aid office about that process, they might want to reach out to them. If they are planning to take summer classes and want to determine whether they have any federal eligibility remaining. The interest rate for 17-18 is 4.45%. That has been, we'll say, steadily increasing in the last few years. Um, I don't think there was a, there was not a major uh, change this most recent year, but it is based um, on the market. So those amounts will change each year, but it is fixed on that loan. So if a student's taking out the loan in 1718, they're going to pay 4.45 percent on that loan for its um, entirety. And then continuing on with loans. Um, there's a loan that is available to parents of dependent students um, that some parents choose to, to take out. It's called a Parent PLUS loan. Um, it is um, a credit-based loan, so a, or, sorry, a parent has to complete a request for the, per for the PLUS loan as well as a master promissory note, and they do have to be approved. Um, and then the eligibility for a parent, um, they can apply for a certain amount, um, or they can apply for any amount that does not, that's not already covered by other funds for the student. So when we award financial aid, we start with the cost of attendance, and we start whether there are scholarships or there's grants, um, work study, loans in the student's name, we, we award the maximum amount. If they still aren't at their cost of attendance, that gap there could be covered by a Parent PLUS loan. The interest rate for 1718 for Parent PLUS loans is at 7% this year. And then the last option there, and usually this is the last option we direct students and families to, um, because usually federal programs have better terms um, than, than others, but we do, um, 
encourage if, if there's still a need to look at private or alternative loans. And a lot of schools will have more information about these, but this is, as it is, a private loan um, that you or your student could apply for. Um, many times students who are dependent students who are coming straight out of high school um, may not be approved for a loan just based on their credit alone. They may need a co-signer, um, but that may be an option um, if a student still has some gap um, to make up. Any questions so far? No? Okay. Okay, so how do I get it? The FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, um, FAFSA.gov. The key word in that acronym is free. So occasionally we have students or parents tell us that they paid to fill out the FAFSA. You don't have to ever pay to fill out the FAFSA. It is, in fact, free. Um, there are some companies, though, that do charge people to fill out the FAFSA. You provide your information to the company and then, then the company goes and fills out your free application for federal student aid and take your money. Um, but go directly to FAFSA.gov. You can complete the FAFSA on your own for free. So the FAFSA information is used to calculate the EFC. So you will put um, your information as parents, students will put your information as students, um, and it will answer a series of questions. We'll go through some of them to determine what that EFC calculation is. Um, the FAFSA for 1819 is available October 1st. So just in like a couple weeks, you'll be able to go out there and submit your FAFSA. Uh, most colleges will set some sort of priority deadline. Um, it seems that most of the Kansas Board of Regent schools from what I last looked, at have set December 1st as a priority deadline. I will tell you that that's what Fort Hayes has decided to do this year. So this is new for us. It is a new priority deadline of December 1. Um, some schools have kept their spring dates. Um, some schools have moved even earlier than December 1. Some schools have decided not to have any priority deadlines. So you'll need to check with the school that you're interested in um, to see what their priority deadlines are. And, and again, I voiced earlier the importance um, of meeting priority deadlines. Um, you will be using 2016 tax information. Um, this was a change that they instituted last year um, in using a previous year tax information. They it used to be that the FAFSA opened in January and you had to include tax information from just the previous year. So we, we many times had students and parents struggling to get the taxes filed so that they could get the FAFSA in and meet the priority deadlines. Um, that has changed. So when students go in to complete their FAFSA for 18-19, they'll be using 2016 tax information, which is already done and filed, right? So um, makes it easier, I think, for students to meet those priority deadlines. They already should have the information that they need and they're not having to wait on being able to file their taxes in order to submit um, the FAFSA information. <laughs> Paper applications are available. However, I would strongly recommend that you apply online. Um, it's quicker, it's easier, um, it's easier for schools to be in contact with you sooner. Um, so I think that there's a great benefit to doing it um, online. If that's not possible, please know that paper is accepted. Um, I don't think they even print those anymore, but you can um, go to the website and print off the application um, if you choose to do paper. So one of the first sections that students will complete is a student demographic section. I'm just going to highlight a few things here, and sometimes these are things, hang-ups, um, that we may see later on, so just kind of things to, to give you a heads up on. You must use your legal name, students, so make sure whatever you put on the FAFSA matches what's on your social security card. You also need to make sure your social security number is correct. We see lots of, you know, transposing digits um, or maybe putting a different student or different um, social on there if perhaps the parent is working on the FAFSA um, may confuse the social security numbers so make sure that the name and the social security number match what is on the social security card um, it will also ask for gender this is a question I believe that's changing this year um, and it is for the purposes of the selective service so the question will be what what gender were you born with and they will then determine if you were born male that you will be required to register with selective service they will ask a citizenship question um, your citizenship 
um, as a U.S. citizen, will have a social security number tied to your legal name. They do a check on that after you submit the FAFSA and make sure that there is a match there. Um, if you are an eligible non-citizen, you would have a social security number as well as an alien registration number um, that needs to be included. For grade level, um, it's important if you are a graduating high school senior right now and you're applying for financial aid for next year, you are an incoming freshman. Okay, so it's not uncommon that we get students who say that they are graduate students because they think, I'm graduating, I'm a graduate student. That's not right, they are freshmen. And they're also not seniors. They're seniors in high school now, but for, for college purposes, they will be a freshman in college. So um, the degree that they are seeking could be an associate's degree, could be a bachelor's degree. Typically would not be a master's at this point or a PhD. So associates or bachelors, yes? Students who are earning the concurrent credit and mm -hmm. maybe have quite a few hours, mm -hmm. they're still considered a freshman. They could come in as a sophomore. Oh, okay. So that, that would be one exception. If, if you have a student who is accruing a large number of concurrent credit hours, like let's say 30 or more, they could be classified as a sophomore. Yes? But would you want them to be for financial aid purposes or would you want them to be classified as a freshman? How do you mean for financial aid purposes? I mean, we, we, I guess, let me back up. For when we determine federal eligibility, we will determine what grade level they are by number of credit hours. So if they're transferring in 30 credit hours, we'll see them as a sophomore. We will award them sophomore loan eligibility, for instance. Does that make sense? <coughs> if you have more questions, come. We'll, we can chat afterwards. Okay. Um, there's also a question about foster care and the students been um, in the foster care system um, and answering that will provide them some additional foster care resources. Students can select up to 10 colleges to receive their FAFSA. Um, we encourage students that if they are thinking about attending a school to go ahead and list that school um, on their FAFSA. Um, one key there or I guess one um, reminder I would like to give students is if you do include let's say seven different schools as you determine you are not attending a particular school um, I would strongly encourage you to contact that school and let them know um, that makes it a little bit easier on them so that they will stop processing your file and they may stop sending you reminders and things like that as well um, did you have a question no, good question. So the question is, do you have to have like an admission application in with the school before you put them on the FAFSA? No, you do not. Um, we will bring in FAFSAs at our institution for anybody who has Fort Hayes listed as a code. Um, we do require before we package them that they be admitted to the university, but many times we see their FAFSA before admission sees their application. That's totally fine. Great question. Um, it will also ask housing questions, and this helps us determine the cost of attendance um, because we have a different cost of attendance for someone who is living on campus versus someone who is living at home. Um, so those are the options, at home with parents, on campus, or off campus. And this can change, so it's okay. If you think it's going to be one thing now and then it ends up being something different later, that's okay. You can go and make a change to that. You're, you're, not, lim you're not, you know, tied in. If you, if you say, I'm living with parents, you're, you're not tied into that if you decide that you are, are not going to. The dependent or independent question, that is the question. Um, we ha many times have students and parents ask us a question about what um, their dependency status should be. And by and large, generally speaking, for students who have just completed high school, um, are most likely considered dependent students. There are a series of questions that are asked on the FAFSA and if they answer yes to any of these questions they can be classified as an independent student. If they can't answer yes to any of these questions they are not classified as an independent student. Dependency status is different for financial aid purposes as opposed to IRS tax purposes. So we do occasionally get questions from students saying, well, I claim myself on my taxes. My parents don't claim me. I should be an independent student. For tax filing purposes, that may be true. However, for FAFSA purposes, it is not. They have different standards um, and their philosophy is that unless you meet one of these, we consider it a parent's um, 
I use the word responsibility, I guess, in this sense, um, to help cover educational costs. Even if they choose not to, or even if the student decides that they don't want help from their parents. Um, unless they meet one of these criteria, they are considered a dependent student. So we do get questions as well as to what parent should I include on the FAFSA. Um, if parents are living together, regardless of whether they're married or not, so if a student's legal parents are living together, they have to include both parents' financial information on the FAFSA. If parents are divorced, the student should include financial information for the parent who they lived with more during the past 12 months. If that parent then is remarried, they also need to include the step-parent's financial information. If a student it has a situation where parents are divorced and they live with each parent equally, so it is split 50-50 exactly, then they should be using the parent who provided more than half of their support during the last 12 months. Guardians, foster parents, and legal guardians are not considered parents unless they have legally adopted the student. So they're looking for legal parents in this scenario. <coughs> so what information do you need to have with you to be able to complete your FAFSA? Taxes, income information, benefit summaries, um, asset information, not including a 401k or IRA balances, and not including the value of your primary residence. That those items do not count against you towards an EFC calculation. Um, you also need to have any untaxed income that you might have, such as child support received. The data retrieval tool. Um, the, the Department of Education had worked with the IRS a few years ago on implementing what's called an IRS data retrieval tool. And this was a really great tool that helped students and parents basically link to the IRS and transfer back their tax information sometimes for both students and parents into the FAFSA. And it was great in terms of it, you know, had the information directly from the IRS, so students didn't have to guess or do, use their best guess on what their tax information was if they didn't have the return in front of them. The other thing that it really helped with was a process called verification. Um, and if a student is selected for verification, they may have to submit additional documents to the financial aid office. The use of the DRT decreased the chance that the student was going to be selected for verification. Um, the DRT tool went down last May sometime for the 1718 award cycle, unfortunately, um, due to some security reasons. So it is on the plan to be re-implemented um, beginning October 1st with the 1819 FAFSA. So you will be able to use the DRT tool. However, there will be some changes for those of you who may have used it in the past. Um, you will not be able to see the actual tax information on the IRS website or on the FAFSA. So you will link to the IRS website, it will say do you want to transfer your information. You hit transfer, but you will not be able to see what those actual numbers are. Um, they, they plan to do, run encryption on both sites, so to keep that information secure, they are not going to display it um, on either site. We still recommend using the DRT tool for the reason that I just mentioned. Um, reduces the chances of additional documents having to be requested later. Um, one thing that will change slightly uh, from last year as well is if parents are filing a joint tax return, you can still use the DRT. Um, however, you will need to enter in the income earned from work manually into the FAFSA. So once you transfer that back from the IRS, you will get to the portion about um, income earned from work. So you will need to have your tax return to be able to identify what those amounts are um, for parents who both have income. So you'll need to put those into parent one and parent two. The DRT is available for most everyone who files a FAFSA. However, there are a couple of instances where they are not, where it is not available. Um, one is if you do not have a social security number, and the second is if you um, are married but you file taxes separately. In that scenario, the DRT tool will not be available. So you will just need to answer that, 
enter that information manually into the FAFSA. <coughs> okay, we covered some of these earlier uh, when I went through some of the screenshots. Um, but just to reiterate a few different items where we see s frequent FAFSA errors. One is with s s social security numbers, um, divorce or remarried parent information, income um, for parents and step parents, untaxed income, taxes paid, household size, uh, number of members in the household attending college, um, real estate and investment net worth, and what assets to include. And the, the advice I give here is that the FAFSA has some really good information and um, definitions and further instructions on a lot of the questions. So a lot of times there's a box that you can click on for more information or for further clarification. I strongly encourage you to read through those um, because a lot of times that can help answer the question that you have about do I include this or do I not include this or how do I figure out who to include in my household or in college. Um, that information uh, provided on the FAFSA I think is really helpful um, in answering some of those questions. If it's not clear from the additional instructions, I would strongly encourage you to contact the financial aid office that you, uh, at the schools that you're applying for and they can give you some additional guidance and answer those questions as well. <coughs> so the FSA ID, um, this is something that you can be doing now. You don't have to wait until October 1st um, and that is creating an FSA ID. Um, the FSA ID is basically a username and password um, that's required for students, parents, and borrowers. So if you're accessing the federal student aid systems and logging in, you're going to need an FSA ID. Um, you can go to fsaid.ed.gov um, to get your FSA ID. So students and parents, if you haven't already done that, you can go do that tonight. Um, it will provide you with secure access to your information. If you would have to log back into the FAFSA to make a correction um, or to complete it, maybe you started the FAFSA, you're not, you don't have everything you need, so you need to save it and then get back to it and, and submit it later, um, you'll need an FSA ID to log in and do that. Um, and you can make, you can do self-service capability so you can make name changes and otherwise for your FSA ID account. It's important to know that every FSA ID needs a unique email address. So parents, this is one of those great lessons for your, you and your students that you can, your student will need an FSA ID and you will need one and they can't be the same email address. So parents, you can't go put your email address on both of them because you're not certain that the student is not going to do what they're supposed to do. So make sure that they're using an email address and an email address that they are going to keep and that they are going to use through the first year of school. Um, that's one other key in, in filling out the FAFSA and it does ask for an email address as well. That sometimes students put an email address, sometimes a high school email address that then expires sometime before they start um, in August at their institution. Um, they can go in and change that on the FAFSA but sometimes they don't remember to do that. So using an email address that is going to be good and that they're checking regularly. Um, because they will get emails from federal student aid and they will likely be getting emails from the schools that they have listed on the FAFSA as well. So encourage them, you know, creating their own FSA ID. It doesn't hurt to give them some reminders or check in with them and make sure that they're checking emails or doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, but again, one of those ways that, that student can be very involved um, throughout this process. So what happens after you file the FAFSA? Um, summary of the application is returned um, to the student. It's called a student aid report. Um, they log in with their FSA ID um, to view the student aid report online. If they notice that anything is wrong or incorrect, they can log back into the FAFSA and make a correction to that. Um, if schools require documentation or further information, they'll make contact with the student directly. Again, why it's important to make sure um, that they know um, how the school is communicating with them. A lot of schools will use that primary email address that they put on the FAFSA. So make sure that, that they're aware of how they're going to reach them. Um, and then I have a note here about FERPA. Um, information that's provided on the uh, FAFSA by the student is the student's information. So 
Um, many schools will have some different policies and guidelines about how you will be able to obtain information, like from a financial aid office, um, about your student, and it may require that the student sign a release um, to give you access to that information. Every school does that a little bit differently. Some have electronic means of doing that. Um, so I would contact the school to find out about that process if you have a need to uh, talk with a financial aid officer, get further information about your student's file. And then a watch for award notices. So once your award um, has been packaged, we'll send an email or however the school communicates with you to let you know that the award has been packaged um, and how you can go about then accepting or declining your awards. It's possible that some schools will not start awarding October 15th. <laughs> it's likely that schools will not be awarding starting October 15th. Um, there are a lot of things that have to be done on the financial aid side of things to be ready to go and process applications. So I would not be shocked if some schools aren't awarding until let's say late December or into January um, before they're able to do that. Um, so be patient. Information will get out there. They'll get things to you, I'm sure, as soon as possible um, and in plenty of time for you to do some comparisons to, between schools that you might be looking at. The key is making sure you get all the information back to the financial aid office as soon as possible. Sometimes students and parents may have special circumstances um, that are different from the information that's provided on the FAFSA. So that could be that maybe there is a change in employment status, maybe for one of the parents, or there is um, unusual medical expenses that haven't been covered by insurance, or maybe there's a change in marital status in parents. Um, and most schools have a process that may be called special circumstances or professional judgment where they can consider those changes and review and, and evaluate the student file. Um, a lot of times they're going to have to have some written documentation um, as well as an explanation from the student about what those changes are. Um, they may, student schools may ask for additional tax return information, pay stubs, depending on what the situation is um, to determine whether or not um, a, a, a professional judgment or change can be made. The decision is final that is made by um, the financial aid office. There's not an appeal process to the Department of Education. So after schools determine financial aid eligibility up front for a student and award their financial aid, our job is not done. We continue to review the student's file for eligibility. One of the ways that we do that is through um, a satisfactory academic progress policy. And this requires that we review a student's file. We do it on a term basis. So after every semester, we review students to determine whether they're meeting the three items listed there. Um, it's time frame, grade point average, and pace. Um, time frame means that they are completing their degree program within 150% of the credit hours required for the degree. So for instance, if you have 120 hours required for the college degree, and they haven't received the degree within 180 attempted hours, they will go on what we call financial aid suspension. Um, a grade point average, Fort Hayes has a graduated scale. Every school does it a little bit differently. If you don't meet a certain GPA, you may be put on financial aid suspension. And then PACE requirement is basically a percentage of the hours completed versus the attempted credit hours. Um, and our policy, um, is that it needs to be at least 67%. So a student has to pass and earn credit for at least 67% of the credit hours that they attempted. If they don't, they're also put on financial aid suspension. Um, our process does allow for an appeal process, and many schools do that, um, that students have an opportunity to appeal that, um, maybe in writing or in person, depending on the school, um, that's reviewed then by a committee, and then they will determine whether or not the student um, can have um, eligibility for the next semester. Um, usually when they do, they do, do put some parameters on it. So it may be that they have to take specific courses or a certain number of credit hours or obtain a certain grade point average. So how do scholarships work? Um, scholarships, as I mentioned earlier, are considered gift aid, similar in that way to grants. Some of them will have restrictions, um, maybe on what they will pay. 
Um, sometimes it may be, you know, it's only going to cover tuition and fees. Um, there may be some enrollment restrictions. They may need to be full time in order to be eligible for the scholarship. And they can come from a lot of different places. They can come from the institution itself, could be from organizations, um, community organizations or otherwise. Could be employers for maybe the student or for the parent. Um, and it continues to grow every day. And I always encourage students to really look at those outside or community scholarships. Um, there are times that students may look at those and say, well, $250 or $500 is not a really large amount of money, and that's not really going to help me. But I have seen a number of students who go out there, apply for everything, um, and they will get several outside scholarships um, that can make a really huge impact on, on their funding for the year. Um, and frankly, even if it's a $250 or $500 scholarship, that may make quite a, a bit of a stab at the, their books and supplies for the semester. So I would strongly encourage students who are in the room or parents to inform your students to strongly encourage them to apply for community scholarships um, that can make a really big difference in their total financial aid package. So where do you find them? Um, institutions, sometimes institutions will have not one, but maybe two applications, um, depending on how they award. Sometimes schools will automatically consider students for some scholarships, but maybe they have an application for other special scholarships. So making sure that you get that information from the institutions. What's the process? Um, when do I need to apply? What is the deadline? Um, and a lot of them do have pretty early deadlines. Um, there are some schools I see out there that have November 1st as their deadline. Um, so, um, schools will do a priority deadline and then a final deadline. Um, it just depends. So make sure you're getting that information in sooner rather than later because like I said, some of those have really early deadlines. Some of them might be based on merit. Some might be based on need. Um, some may require that the student does some sort of follow-up requirement. Um, and some may be renewable, but others may not be. Um, and if they are renewable, there might be some specific uh, parameters that they need to meet. So it may be a grade point average, or it could be a certain number of credit hours that they need to complete. So making sure that students are aware of, of what those are up front. The Kansas Board of Regents does have a scholarship program as well. Um, they do have a separate application, so going to this website, which is listed on your handout, um, will take you to the main page um, and have application materials there for you. And they do have several programs. I have them all listed there, but I won't go through all of them. They're on your handout as well um, that students might be eligible for. So I'd encourage students to apply for those. And then where do you go from here? Um, so making sure that you're getting information from admissions and financial aid for all the schools that you're interested in attending. Um, check out their websites, but call their offices if you're not finding what you need um, from each school online. Make sure you're meeting application deadlines. So make sure you're meeting the priority deadline for the FAFSA at that school, as well as any scholarship deadlines that they might have. Make sure you're submitting documents quickly um, in response to a financial aid office, for instance, that might need follow-up documents. And do the research on what aid's out there. I know that your counselors do a really good job of sharing information about scholarship opportunities and otherwise, um, but get out there on your own as well and research opportunities that might be there to apply. <coughs>